Welcome to the second part of this talk, stay at home. And I will continue with the discussion of how much does nowadays about mixed quantum classical dynamics cost. You can make a basic estimate of the cost in the following way. The total time that you are going to need to allocate to do your project, to do your dynamics, is going to be more or less the number of trajectories that you need to compute times the number of single points you must compute in, in every trajectory times the time to compute one single point. The number of single points is roughly uh, the time of the chemical process, like one picosecond, divided by the time step of integration of equations, like half femtosecond. Then if I plug in this formula, uh, typical figures for, 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 for dynamics, like 100 trajectories, half CPU hour per single point, one picosecond of the chemical process, and a half femtosecond for the time step, it gives a total of 100,000 CPU hours. And that's quite a lot of time allocated, especially if you take into consideration that one CPU hour cost in the market like uh, two cents of euro. And then this project is going to cost 2,000 euros to run. And you may ask yourself what is the best way of allocating your funds. funds. And I'm always telling the people who work with me, if you can solve your problem, if you can do your dynamic, so, uh, solve your problem, scientific problem without doing dynamics, you are in the profit side, it's better. But anyway, if you really need to do dynamics, there are two strategies to follow, to cope with the computational costs. The first is to reduce the statistical ensemble. And this is going to affect the precision of the calculation. You reduce the number of trajectories, you reduce the time uh, of the chemical process, so the trajectory are going to be shorter. You can increase the time step. This, of course, is going to, to impact the quality of the dynamics, but you know exactly how to solve it. Just increase, if you need, increase the number of trajectories, for instance. The second strategy to cope with the computational costs is, is much more critical is to downgrade the electronic structure method, to reduce the time to compute a single point. And this affects the accuracy of the simulation. And then it isn't so easy to fix anymore. So, getting things done fast, downgrade the electronic structure level. What's the implication of that? No other but mixed quantum classical dynamics are often uh, uh, run with a uh, small double zeta base set with methods providing an incomplete treatment of the electronic correlation like Kaiser CF, which misses the dynamic, uh, dynamic electron correlation, or TDDFT or HC2, which will miss the non-dynamic electron correlation, and more fragment orbitals, independent electrons, single configuration DFT, semi pico Hamiltonians, scaled Kaiser CF, and the list goes on like this. And in principle, it may work. It may sound strange to run dynamics with a, a single reference method. I'm talking about non back dynamics. Should I even try to do, use a single reference method for that? But in principle, yes. Look, for instance, at this topography, this uh, very schematic topography of uh, excited state surfaces. Or oh, the ground state's the lowest one, and then we have three excited states. And then, let's suppose you have a trajectory here. My trajectory is going to start in the second excited state. And then it jumps to the first, and then it goes to the ground state. Let's see... Uh, what happens during the dynamics? Right in the beginning of the dynamics, T0, 
I don't really have any problem to compute my quantities there with, an, with, a, multi, uh, with a single reference method like TDDFT or ADC2. Because the secret here is that the ground state is a single reference state, which means that the excited state may be fine. With exception of excited states with multiple excitation if I'm using a linear response method, like TDDFT. Then, if I look at a region, at a region of a crossing between excited states, like I have here, there, I also don't have any problem, because my ground state is still a single reference state, and this, uh, treat, and this uh, region here is well treated. I may have problems with no emission uh, methods like CC2, but in general, I can do the calculations well in such a, a, a crossing between excited states. Then, I come to the minimum of the excited state, of the first excited state, and naturally, no problem at all. Especially there, the, the, the ground state is still a single reference I can compute well. And after some time, the trajectory reaches the connect section of the ground state. And here is the problem. There, the ground state is a multi-reference state. And the, I can't use TDDFT, I can't use uh, ADC2, I can't use a single reference method anymore to compute there. And everything that happens afterwards, if I just continue my dynamics, is going to be garbage. So I can do it. But anyway, I can learn a lot about the dynamics of my system until it reaches this region here. Not afterward, but until here is fine. So if I want, for instance, to determine the, the, the time constant to go to the ground state, I may be able to do so using a single reference method. Then, how reliable non-adiabatic mixed quantum classical dynamics really is? Look at this ensemble of molecules. My team has computed all these molecules in the last years, and these are real simulated cases. And when I was looking at the sequence of molecules, I noted, noticed something interesting. I start with this small cyclohexadiene, 14 atoms, half picosecond, and then adenine, 15 atoms, 1 picosecond, and then arachanic acid with 18 atoms, 2 picoseconds, and then this cycloparafenaline with 100 atoms and 3 picoseconds. You see that the complexity of the simulations is increasing from the left to the right, increasing the number of atoms, increasing the time of the simulation. And look at the electronic structure that you had to use for to 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 do each one of them. For, sm for the smallest, you have CASPT2, and then ADC2 for the other, and then a semi-empirical CI for the third, and then a kind of semi-empirical DFT for the last one. You don't grade the level. To increase the complexity of the system, of the molecular system, you had to downgrade the quality of the electronic structure. And what's the implication of that for the result of the dynamics? Look at the result for adenine again. Adenine has three connect sections, one that has a puckering in the C2 atom, another one with a out of plane pl uh, puckering in the C6 atom, and NH, N9H dissociation. And then when we run dynamics, we see a distribution of these three connect sections and I can get the time. Uh, I know from the experiments that the S0 population after one picosecond is about 68%. Uh, uh, 68%. And this ADC, ADC2 dynamics does quite a fair job, giving 57 plus minus 12%. So that's fine. What would happen if I just repeated exactly the same dynamics using a different, uh, different electronic structure method. That's what happens. That's the worst of the worlds. It's extreme method dependence. 
and they can just have whatever result I want. Look in particular that in the t in the in the dense functional world, all results are qualitatively wrong. They can't describe, they can't predict the ultrafast deactivation of adenine. The wave function world is a bit better. They are predicting the ultrafast, but by the distribution of colors there, distribution of connector sections, you see they are predicting the right result for different reasons. And that's not acceptable at all. Look, I'm not saying that TDDFT is always going to do a bad job. On the contrary, I have nice examples of TDDFT working very well. I'm saying that for adenine in particular, TDDFT with all these different flavors of functional did not work at all. But it may work in other cases. It's a case by case thing. And also in the wave function world, um, there's no guarantee that ADC2 is always going to do a nice job like it's doing here. But in this case of adenine, it did a pretty a pret, a pret good job. If you take the XMS KSPT2 as the reference benchmark best method for describing the dynamics of adenine. Why do you have such a strong dependence on the method? Here is the root of all evil. It's in the diabatic nature of the method. Suppose that you have two methods, QM method 1 and QM method 2. Both are describing the NPI and the pi pi star states. Typical situation for small organic molecules. You look at these pictures and then you can write in your paper that uh, they are qualitatively in agreement, so you are happy with this. But it's a qualitative agreement, but in terms of quantitative, look at the pi pi star slightly, or oh, pretty much stabilized with QM method 2 in comparison to QM method 1. Then when I get the adiabatic states, that's actually what I used to do the dynamics. They are going to look like this. And then when I run dynamics with QM method 1, I end up in the left side of the, of the potential well, and if I do with QM method 2, I end up in the right side of the potential well. And this is the problem. No affordable method can describe all characters at the same level. An excited state spectral region has a very high density of states. I do a small variation in the geometry, and it leads to a change of the electronic character. And that's happening all the time. If I have a method that can do the wrong job systematically for every kind of method, I wouldn't be so worried. But they don't do it like this. You take a time-dependent uh, TDFT or a DFT with a, a b 3 lip function, for instance, is going to do a good job for a localized state, but to be a crap job for the charge transfer state. You take guys a CF is going to do a good job for a uh, valence state, but you're going to give a completely destabilized ionic state. And this kind of shift of error between different diabatic characters is going to cause the wrong topography of the adiabatic surfaces. So, how can we do non adiabatic mixed quantum classical dynamics, but in a reliable way? My bet right now is on machine learning. Machine learning in quantum chemistry, everyone uh, knows, is getting really uh, a major momentum right now. And suppose that we have to solve some complicated and expensive nonlinear equations many, many, many times. For instance, we must do cusp 2 energy for energies for many different geometries. Would it be possible to replace this set of uh, complicated and expensive com uh, equations by a simple system, like for instance, this one here, where I can just by comparison to some reference geometry, or I 
estimate my energy or my any other property that I may want. So in principle, what I'm doing here is a simple expansion linear in this parameter alpha. And of course, to get that, I need first some training information and I need this alpha. And machine learning algorithms are exactly the, uh, the, the algorithm to allow getting them. Machine learning starts to be used for non adiabatic mixed quantum classical dynamics by many groups. Here, I just uh, collect a few references that appeared in the last couple of years. They are probably the first attempt to do uh, mixed quantum classical dynamics. And we have done ourselves, uh, no, our first implementation is a collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Walter Thiel and, and Pablo Dral, where we look at the, developed a very simple implementation. We call it the model zero for machine learning, where you do the surface hopping with machine learning when the gap is large, and every time that you go into a small gap, you turn on the quantum mechanical propagation. You don't you don't predict the the neurobatic coupling. But even with this trivial, very simple model, we saw very nice results. Before showing the results, let me just tell you how this is done. First, you have to train the machine. Train the machine means for an ensemble of geometries we must compute the desired property, like energy, gradients, couplings. And then we build the machine, which means to write this expansion. Let's suppose the gradient. Why is the gradient? Uh, the gradient for geometry RJ is written in terms of the summation over every part RJ or I run over every possible geometry and now we must solve for alpha. K is a kernel function that's going to be one when Rj and Ri are close to each other and the zero when they are far away, which means that the summation tells uh, the proximity between the the, the, the the geometries and it's going to give the information about uh, the property that I, that I want to, to, to estimate. In fact, in the actual simulation, you use something a bit more complicated than a, than a Gaussian kernel, but the idea is always the same. But now that I have this set of equations, I have my machine model I can solve them. We do that with ML atom developed by Pablo Dral, and we get the alpha parameters. And then, now that we have alpha, we can use the machine. Every time that I have a new geometry, R, instead of solving the Schrodinger equation, I can get my gradient of my energy for this geometry, R, by solving this summation. That's trivial and extremely fast. And if everything is fine, the machine learned property will be approximately the quantum mechanical property. Now, here the result for this first model zero dynamics, you did two picoseconds evolution of the, of the S1 occupation for a 33 dimensional model, average over 1000 trajectories, and you get very nice results with a factor, almost a factor 10 of cost reduction using 10,000 training points. That's pretty affordable. Then it comes to a point that it seems that we can do reliable dynamics at affordable price. But when should we do dynamics? Or when should we not do dynamics? This is the last point that I want to discuss in the third part of this talk.